On this edition of In the Life, the right to love. If our relationship had legal standing, it was recognized by the state, I wouldn't have to be afraid of being put out of ICU by his family. From our partners. I told her that I wanted to be female, that I was transsexual. To our children. A coming out process for a parent is sometimes more difficult than the coming out process for a child. All this and more on America's gay and lesbian news magazine, In the Life. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmerengen Foundation, additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the New Paul Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Charles Bush, and it's great to be back to host this month's episode, The Right to Love. Tonight, in honor of Valentine's Day, we're going back into our archives to revisit stories that celebrate love and commitment. You're about to meet some compelling couples whose lives reflect the diversity and resilience of the LGBT community. Tonight, happily ever after. So she came to my house and gave me a perm, <laughs> and I kissed her. When she left, I cried. Huh? Huh? I knew it was love, and we went out for coffee that night. And Kate Clinton speaks out. Learn your lesbian and gay history. Take a class in it. Teach it. Don't just talk amongst yourselves. Talk to each other. A year and a half ago, we first met Chuck Allen and Todd Roulette in the midst of hectic preparations for their wedding day. The implications of the great marriage debate suddenly became very real when an unexpected crisis interrupted their plans. Going to the chapel and we're gonna get married. We are Ever since I was a small boy, I always wanted to be married. I always wanted to have kids. Along the way, I kind of lost faith that that was ever going to happen. The ceremony's going to be at St. Philip's Church, which is a really big deal. It's going to be, you know, a, a communion service, actually, with a, uh, a officiated over by our priest. It was very important for me to have this ceremony in our parish and it to be witnessed and blessed by the church. As active members of St. Philip's Episcopal Church, Chuck and Todd asked their priest to host the commitment ceremony. St. Philip's, like any church these days, is going through the same questioning and answering and objections and acceptances that one could describe about the nation. Some people in our congregation who may not understand what this is all about, may not even accept the idea of same-sex union are capable of seeing us like they would see or have seen their brothers, their nephews, their cousins, their grandchildren, and, and accepting us with love even if they don't understand the full circumstance. Many of us feel that it's time to stand up and be counted and to uh, urge the church to uh, change its tradition. This church has decided to recognize that we're committed to each other in a, in a relationship, and that's significant. Going against tradition, Reverend Mother Cecily Broderick granted Todd and Chuck's request for a church ceremony. This is what Reverend Broderick read on Homecoming Sunday. Todd, Roulette, and Chuck Allen will affirm their commitment to live together for the rest of their lives during a union ceremony in St. Philip's Church. The bishop for, for this jurisdiction has decided that each parish, uh, with its priests, should come up with a wise decision for the couple in question. Hopefully, in the way that we're doing this, we'll have people talking about our need, and I think our right to have 
wider acceptance and, 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 and legal protection. Marriage, uh, under all the state laws, confers upon the individuals getting married over a thousand plus rights, both federal and state, that uh, are not granted to same-sex couples. If their partner's in the hospital, they don't have the right to visit. They don't have the right to make medical decisions for their partner. They don't have the right to arrange for burial or cremation. They don't have the right to inherit. They don't have the right to social security. They don't have the right to pension. Too many to list. The ceremony was canceled um, two weeks before the date because Chuck got sick. Todd called me and said, you know, I gotta bring your brother to the hospital. You know, he's feeling sick. He's not able to move him around. He's having trouble urinating. I was like, well, what's wrong with him? I had a little backache, but you know, I attribute that to just maybe needing a little more exercise and getting a little older and uh, things like that. And it um, turned out to be quite major. It's uh, cancer. It's been really, really difficult to, you know, come to the hospital at 7 a.m. or 7.30 in the morning and see him off into surgery and not be able to do anything. I'm very scared. I'm very, very, very scared. You know, I'm scared that he's going to lose faith. I'm afraid that he's going to lose hope at some point, and he's going to—he's not going to fight. And I really need him to fight for both of us. It would be kind of difficult to understand why I would be allowed to survive through seven surgeries and all of the agony and all of the problem, no. losing 30 or 40 pounds, maybe more, uh, gaining them back, all of the rehabilitation and not be able to, you know, to contribute and stand on my feet again. If our relationship had legal standing, was recognized by the state, um, I wouldn't have to be afraid of being put out of ICU by his family. Um, I wouldn't have to um, constantly assert my, my relationship and um, enforce someone to acknowledge it. Um, or force them simply even to say that I'm his family. What a lot of people don't realize, even in the gay and lesbian community, is that a religious ceremony uh, confers upon you absolutely no rights in relation to your partner. Um, it's a beautiful ceremony. Um, you bring all your family, and it, it will be very meaningful to you personally. But legally, it has no effect. Since Chuck has been ill, I think a lot of the plans for that have had to be a little uncertain, but uh, one thing is very certain, they want to do it. <laughs> At this point now, we're, we're looking forward to Chuck finishing his cancer treatment and making um, plans for our future together. Todd and I are eventually, under some condition, going to make some kind of a commitment publicly before our church. We're not sure when. We're thinking now maybe spring, uh, but you know, it's, a, it's a, a whole different condition. I hope that uh, uh, Chuck and Todd and all the Chuck and Todds of the world are able to have a better life. And in the midst of the, of the suffering that this thing has represented, for them personally and for thousands and thousands of others, I just hope that the things we do today will, will uh, ease the way. The first time we met, we were 18, and we had no idea who, you know. We later, we met each other later on in life, but the first time we met, we were 18 years old. Um, Brian was babysitting for my brother's children, and I went over to my brother's house to, uh, Talk to him, tell him that my parents were looking for him, and um, this kid came to the door, and I, I asked... I wouldn't let him in. <laughs> well, I was protecting the kids. I didn't know who he was. So uh, I asked um, where my brother was, and he said, that's just what he said. And um, I said, well, please tell him that, you know, his parents are looking for him. And he was, uh, that was him at 18. 
And then I had gone off to college, and uh, I came back four years later. I was doing theater. I was on the road for two years. And I had gone uh, to see friends of mine at a summer stock where I had done work. And we all went to this gay bar on Long Island. And it was just reopening, so I went in. And um, when they were my friends, I went to the bar. I ordered a beer. And this guy was behind the bar, and I was, like, smitten. And um, it was him again. Only it was uh, six years later. And he was over-tipping. He <laughs> caught my attention right away. I figured if I could buy him. Because that was years ago. You could Who knew get it was that easy? You could get a beer for 65 cents, and he was giving me a dollar fifty. I thought he was rich. Huh. Little did I know. <laughs> Two years ago in The Life went backstage with singer Katie Curtis, whose career and personal relationship were about to dramatically change with the arrival of a new and tiny addition to her family. Town, you can see the stars at night, even from downtown, because there are no city lights. Katie has produced five albums. Now Katie has completed her sixth album, and she has a new title which may or may not make it into the press. Mom. When I was in college, I was really clear that I wanted to try making it as a musician somehow. When I graduated, and then that I would give it five years or so and then see how it went. Katie Curtis first burst onto the scene in 1996 with her hit album, Truth From Lies, a fitting title for a young artist who faced the decision to be or not to be out in her career. So at first I felt like, oh well, I'd probably be better off not being out. You know, this was like in the late 80s, early 90s. And then I started writing songs that were so clearly related to the gay experience that I didn't really have a choice. And I felt like, OK, if I'm going to perform these songs and be myself, I'm going to be out, and I'll just have to see how it goes. But I'm not being radical when I kiss you. I was at that time signed to a major label, and they decided they were really going to go with radical as a not only as the single, but also as a way to promote me as an out gay artist. And, you know, she's out. She's not afraid to talk about it. I'm not radical when I kiss you. Since she first burst onto the music scene, Katie has produced five albums that have carried listeners down a nuanced path of romance and relationships. I would say, you know, 75% of my material ends up being about relationships. Splitting her time between her long-term partner Elizabeth, her adopted daughter Lucy, and a whirlwind touring schedule, Katie has a lot to sing about. While balancing love and a career on the road was hard enough, 2003 proved the most challenging and rewarding year of all. Fortunately, filmmaker Rob Millis caught the year on tape for his documentary, Tangled Stories. As I began to shoot, she sort of mentioned that, oh, we're adopting a child, and uh, could be any time now that we'll find out uh, who the child is and where and be matched with her. Oh, and I also left my record label, too, this year, so I'm trying everything on my own for the first time in my career. I signed with Vanguard, and we adopted a baby at the same time. And suddenly, this became the biggest year of her life. I am officially a mother. Yes, it's true! partner Liz has always thought that she would have a family and thought maybe she would like to get pregnant and have a baby. So for it was more of her decision about whether she wanted to, you know, go the biological route or the adoption route. And I was, I think, all along sort of pulling for adoption. They decided to adopt, and Katie and Liz were eventually matched with the baby of their dreams, Lucy. But in order to bring her home legally, they had to confront a system that made Katie a silent partner. It was really hard when we first filled out the paperwork for me to realize that um, only one of us could be on the paperwork. I think I was the most upset when we had to go to 
our friends and we had to go to people at work and ask for letters of recommendation for just the one person. Because I felt like, how could it be that it seems to anyone that it's better if it's just this one person than if it's two of us? And you know, it was very difficult to accept that and I was very angry at the time. world for me when we went through this process of trying to adopt Lucy and you know it was very trying and very uh, required a lot of patience and faith because it kept seeming like it was gonna fall through well, there's a baby being born somewhere once marriage is legal either you know just in Massachusetts or or throughout the US someday um, that's actually gonna create some complications for people trying to adopt internationally because if Liz and I were legally married when we tried to adopt internationally, we would have been denied. I, I, I remember walking through the airport with Liz and the baby and Liz was worried that maybe I was freaking out. So she was like, are you okay? And I was like, Liz, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> like I just felt so high. Like, Oh my God, this feels so right. Here we are, like we're three people now and like we're a tribe and I'm really happy. I've got something to give In this town where I wanna live so What's the matter? What's the matter? I ask is, why be afraid of this She gave me a makeover <laughs> because yeah, she needed. She was a housewife, <laughs> right, like, right. you know. She gave me a makeover. You know, she had the body and everything, but I guess from being married, having a child, she didn't explore it, you know. And I knew behind all that <laughs> was a lot more. Right. And so she came to my house and gave me a perm, <laughs> and I kissed her. When she left, I cried <laughs> because I didn't ever have a perm. And then as time went on, um, she liked you know, the perm. I liked the fabulous, perm. Right. She changed me. You no, know, she got me to feel sexy. I never knew what it was to feel sexy, and because I told her, you know, if if you have it, you know, I mean, while you're young, you know, show it because when you get older, you know, you have so why not, you know, go right. sexy. She's gonna go to a, a club where it's all women, so nothing's, you know, right. gonna not happen. To you're right. with me. Yeah, usually. And I like to actually show, you know, yeah, what show I show off what yeah, she exactly. has. Exactly. Whereas know, before, I, I get to real. Right, my ex-husband would be hiding what you have. So that's where, you know, I was very insecure and figured, well, this is the way I'm supposed to be. No, she wanted it out. <laughs> so she, you know, made me beautiful and sexy. So, you know, she made me proud of myself. Our next story takes us on the road with a highly compatible couple whom we met almost five years ago. As you'll see, they navigate the aggravations of the highway with some comforts of home and a dry sense of humor. If you want to learn about somebody, Come a trucker and go out with me. <laughs> you learn everything. Trucking is an unbelievable intimacy because we're with each other so much. You get to know each other better than, than we would if we had separate jobs here at home and only saw each other at night on the weekends. Carl Warren and Tom Walker live in Tallahassee, Florida, and a number of other states while on the road as gay truckers. The couple met at an HIV support group. After years of casual friendship, something more developed. I liked him a long time ago, but he was with somebody else. I'm like, I'm, I won't cross that line. You know, if they break up and I see him again, then I'll make my move. I knew it was... That's I... what happened. <laughs> I knew it was love, and we went out for coffee that night. We hadn't seen each other in a while, and the restaurant was closing, so we came back to my house. I was living around the corner at the time, and made coffee, and about one or two in the morning, looked into his face, and there was that, I call it the perfect moment, time stops, and your entire world exists in that one moment in time. 
And that's when I knew. And it was, okay, it's time to run with this. There's something here. And so we never have, since then, we've never been apart. Carl Warren and his semi are leased full-time to one of the largest trucking companies in the nation. On paper, Tom Walker is Carl's employee. Mm -hmm. Together, they haul freight throughout the U.S. and Canada. When their relationship began, however, Carl did all the driving, and Tom was just along for the ride. Basically, that's all he's doing is sitting in the passenger seat watching the world go by. <laughs> yeah, boredom gets the best of you after a while. So it worked out. Um, he went to school, and shortly after that, we bought the truck. And that's when it got interesting. <laughs> Interesting, because while Tom now had his commercial driver's license, he lacked the experience required by the trucking company to be on the road as a team driver. The company requested that we not identify them, citing fears of negative reactions among customers and the general public. But they tell us at the time of Carl and Tom's request, company policy allowed only legally married couples, that is, husband and wife teams, to pair up in an on-the-job training type situation. Carl and Tom wanted that policy changed. There were certain hiring requirements if I hired another driver, which basically was what was going to be happening. And he needed a year's experience, th uh, this type of training, that type of training, it, the list went on. And it was our, my driver manager, uh, who still is, came up with the idea of putting him on under the spousal program. I mean, for God's sakes, all that was missing was a marriage certificate, house, checking account, the car, our lives are so intertwined, it's not even funny. And she initiated going through the spousal program. I was impressed with it. Mm -hmm. like, you know, this, you know, apparently she really cares about, you know, her drivers, and it's like, we'll do, she'll do what she has to, to try to make them happy. You know, uh, if you keep your drivers happy, they'll work harder for you. It took six months, but the company rewrote its policies to include all non-married domestic partners, including gay and lesbian couples. Carl and Tom say their hauler responded positively to their requests, but it took time to write the policies properly. The efforts of these out and proud pioneers and those of their immediate supervisor helped pave the road ahead for other gay and lesbian truckers. There's a lot more gay truckers than you'd think. Actually, for gay couples who especially lesbians, oh, lots of women, lots of women. Gay couples who don't do the circuit, don't do, you know, I'm going to the Hamptons this weekend. We're, we're home bodies. When we're home, we're home. We don't go to clubs. And you'll find that most of the gay truckers are exactly like that. <laughs> it's the perfect way to get to know someone better because you're together all the time. It's just a great way for gay couples to be able to stay together, and there's so many of them. Come on, Jake, truck, 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 Fozzie, truck. Along with their dogs, Jake and Fozzie, the couple spends an average of 21 days in a row Whoa. out on the open Jake. road, taking turns behind the wheel. Let's go, let's go. Every now and then, you know, it, it gets a little bit tedious. Whenever I get really aggravated or anything, I just kind of get real quiet, you know, I guess. We kind of learned to tell when the other one's having a bad day or if they're in a real nasty mood or something like that. Um, you know, just basically just let them alone. Spending that much time together, especially on the truck in such a confined space, if he gets quiet, I'll ask every once in a while, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. But if we're running hard, Believe it or not, we'll only see each other three hours of that day because either he's in the bunk or I am and the other one's yeah. driving because we have to take so much time off before we can drive again. Remind me at B-Service to have that clutch readjusted again. Well, it's flipping. Never since the fuel pump blew. Each clocks hundreds of hours and thousands of miles between return trips home. Home time is very busy. In fact, we do more at home than we do on the road. You have to maintain the house, you know, laundry. Just make sure that you keep the basics up. In some ways, it's like having two homes to take care of, because yeah, when we come in, not only does the house have to be taken care of, routine maintenance and bills getting paid and taking care of the dogs, making sure they're all set, then we have our home on the road that has to be completely stripped down cleaned and put back together again before we go back out. 
Boy, this is gonna be good. The only disadvantage that I don't like about trucking is you may have to go two or three days without a shower. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's like a shower is... A luxury. Is a luxury. It's like <laughs> a gift from the gods. When he starts talking oh, about a, a good, hard, peel your skin shower, I know it's time to go home. <laughs> Whether on the road or at home, the couple tells us they don't oh. get too many hassles from other truckers about being gay. They attribute I'm that in large part to their open and honest approach children. to their lives. We all went in. We We're also we in. not the flamboyant type. We don't like, Once. we're gay, here we are. I mean, it's just... obvious that we're a couple. Yeah. So we've been told it's, it's just that obvious that we're more than just friends and more than just driving partners. But we don't go out of our way to say, you know, hi, we're gay and all that. I'm quite happy with the way things are. Uh, if I feel that I need time to myself, I'll stay home, let him go back out by himself, you know. But basically, I enjoy being around him and being with him and all that. And I, I really wouldn't have any other way myself. In a few years, Carl and Tom plan to buy a new truck and customize it just the way they want so they can continue living life on the open road together. The highlight of my day, and we've been together two and a half years now, is still having time where we can just cuddle up and watch TV or have a night where we can actually sleep together even on the road. Sometimes that gets hard to do, despite the fact we're in the same space. Uh, that's still the highlight of my day. I love being around him. He compliments my life in so many ways. We exchanged information and Pam started calling me and calling me and calling me. And um, my roommate actually thought she was a stalker. And uh, I started to get a little concerned too, especially when she started buying me things like this. So a um, little Hershey's mm. kiss and I thought, oh God, she's buying me stuff. And um, so a person that, a friend of mine actually talked me into going out with Pam saying, you know, give the girl a chance. She seems to be nice, give her a break. So we did, and um, I, we have been going out ever since. I don't think we ever dated anyone no, else dated after else. that. that um, within about a year and a half or so, we moved in together. And um, we've been together February 27th. It'll be six, six years. years. Still to come on In the Life. You take the transgender piece out of it, it's Ozzy and Harriet. What right does society have to call my son a faggot than all these names? I have saved more children's lives and given them opportunities that they never would have had if they didn't meet me, their lesbian, Jewish, left-handed guidance counselor. Let's go behind the scenes and meet a couple who've adapted to an unusual transformation in their marriage. Filmmaker Emily Goldberg spent several years following this unique partnership in her award-winning documentary, Venus of Mars. I met Venus when she was still S Steve, and I'd seen him perform with this rock band, and I was just absolutely blown away. I was like, this is David Bowie, you know, incarnate. Let's see, all the pretty horses with transvestite lead vocalists. Yeah, transvestite, take a look at those. And then a few years later, I knock on the door, and there's Steve with breasts, you know, and wearing a low-cut vinyl bra, and I said, can we have lunch? I scared transgender people. They get uncomfortable around me. I'm creepy, I'm scary. Because I was just curious about this really dramatic transition um, in someone that I knew but didn't know very well. And so that's sort of how it, how it began. I don't really think of myself as either male or female. Medically, I'm in between. 
I didn't know that I would feel comfortable at this point. I thought I would probably eventually go all the way with surgical change, but I found a strength and a uniqueness being in between. Liza Kitty. I feel it I don't think people up here realize that there's more out there than, than sweatpants and flannel shirts and the Vikings. We need people like this in Duluth. We need an awakening, I think. <laughs> I think they're very, very, very talented. But they're uh, guys dressed as chicks, and I don't like looking at that. How's that? It's so easy for people to categorize people and say, well, I don't understand you, you're weird. Venus lives in the Midwest. It's really important, probably more important for Venus and the band to be playing places where they don't see transgendered people. You look at this incredible glam fetish band and you think, oh my God, he must be out partying every night and he must be, you know, living in a dungeon or something. But you know, he's, he's married, he's got a totally normal life. I watch him play with his cats and work in his garden. His wife's an English professor. If you take the transgender piece out of it, it's Ozzy and Harriet. When I found out that Steve was still married, um, I, was, I was absolutely fascinated by, you know, how does a couple negotiate that kind of dramatic gender identity change within a relationship? Huh? Huh? About a year and a half or so after we got married, I guess the honeymoon period was over. Steve! He was getting progressively crankier and crankier, and I didn't know why. I was really going through this period of identity crisis. I had to decide what I was going to do. We just couldn't deal with having the marriage dissolve. And so that's when I told Lynette. I told her that I wanted to be female, that I was transsexual. What I wanted to do was to show that these people are not so different. And as time went on, I realized it was a film about any long-term relationship. <laughs> You're bad. You're really bad. <laughs> There are things about him that I, that I discovered that I didn't know before that make me love him more, you know? Um, and I just, it's hard to imagine starting over with somebody else. It really is, finding somebody else like him. And even the parts that drive me nuts are, are things that I love about him that I, I would probably seek out in someone else very much like him. And so it's like, well, what's the point? Might as well work on this. Both Venus and Lynette have said to me it was almost like therapy for them making this film and being able to talk to me about what they've, what they've been through. Most couples don't survive. Most couples fall apart. It's a hard journey. It's a real hard road to go down. It's hard for one person to go down it. It's hard when a second person feels like they're getting dragged along without a choice. Do you think Lynette is exceptional in, you know, in her ability to understand and work through all this with you? Yeah, I do. There have been a lot of documentaries done about, about people changing gender. And what made this difference different was it was about how does that impact a, a marriage? And the other thing that was different about it too is that, uh, is that Venus wasn't having a sex change. You know, she's in between and she's staying in between, maybe in part to preserve her relationship. Sometimes I worry about that. Is he not being true to himself? You know, that sort of thing. But he says no, he says that this is the road he would have ended up with anyway. So I have to believe that. But again, that's another thing that you, you really don't know until you've gone through the test of time. I wish that it wouldn't be such an issue for me. I wish that it wasn't something that made Lynette feel like she was being dragged along, something unknown and scary. I think that we have dealt with it better than I could have dreamed, but it's not perfect. I mean, ideally, 
I'd, I'd like for people to walk away from this with a deeper understanding of what it is to be human and that it's not, we're not as different from each other as, as we think we are. There's all the, you know, the complications of you know, marriage, relationship, blah, 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 but when it comes right down to it, it's, we're all just part of this human struggle and that, that's what I want people to take away from it. He asked me out to dinner, and that led to flowers every other week. And before you know it, we were hooked up as a couple. And it's been a good run. I, uh, I like this man very much, so I think so that's important I. in the relationship. And uh, a friend told you to come in to get a haircut, right? Yes. And you, and you, and you uh, at that point, ran to the shop. Exactly. Uh, one of my friends told me about this handsome guy that used to work in the, <clears throat> this store in Christopher Street. And since uh, it was a few days before my 40th birthday, I said, I think so, I need a new haircut. And I went to the barber shop, and Richard was with his uh, short, uh, with his vest. Of course, uh, like almost no old muscle boy. Well, that was 10 years ago. 10 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But, you still look, but you still look good looking oh, and sexy, and I still you. love you in the same way that I met all, you know, 10 years ago anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, we aired a segment celebrating the 25th anniversary of the organization PFLAG, or Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. In keeping with this evening's theme of commitment, we think it's fitting to re-acknowledge the love and ingenuity of this devoted team of parents and friends. The group was born out of a sense of moral outrage when one mother's son was attacked and beaten because he was gay. Furious that the crime was being ignored by the press, she went into action. I sat down and wrote a letter to the New York Post. The next day, Morty called me and said, Mom, you can't imagine all the attention your letter has gotten. People keep calling me and congratulating me that my, my mother would announce in the newspaper that she had a great gay son. That June, Morty asked Jean to march with him in the gay pride parade. Jean agreed, as long as she could carry a sign telling people why she was there. And as I walked along, people started to yell and scream, and I didn't know what it was all about. <laughs> But they kissed me and hugged me and asked me if I would speak to parents and would I call them. And uh, so Morty and I dis discussed it as we walked, and Morty said we ought to get have a groups together to talk and to set these people right. At the same time, Amy Ashworth was also grappling with the news that her son was gay. It's such a distinct moment in my life when I realize what right does society have to call my son a faggot and all these names? And I was concerned about him. Would he be happy? Would he get a job? And uh, would he find somebody? In 1973, Jean, Amy, and a handful of other parents of gay children began holding monthly meetings. I was so overwhelmed by the stories of gay and lesbians who spoke every other month and um, that they changed my whole opinion. And I realized it was so wrong what society did, and it was a question of human rights. And I was so impressed with Parents for Leg. And uh, we called it POG. And Dick said after the first meeting, Amy, that's a good group, we should go back. Well, most of the people came crying, what did I do, what didn't I do? What, what was wrong, it's my fault. In those days, the issues had very much to do with harassment, assault, and in some cases, death for uh, sons and daughters. As members of POG traveled around the country and met other parents, the organization grew. By the 80s, there were sometimes we had 50 people. I found the parents were the bridge between the two societies, so, the more people you talk to slowly, people change their opinion. I think the biggest thing is to get society to change, and I think it slowly worked. In 1981, POG became Parents and Friends of Lesbian and Gays, or PFLAG. 
and local chapters cropped up across the country challenging the organization to meet their specific needs. When I walked into a meeting, I was the only African-American person there. I, in fact, I was the only person of color. And it was a huge meeting. There were like at, at least 90 people in the room. In the late 80s, Maple Flagg went to a meeting to seek guidance after finding out that her daughter was a lesbian. They made me as welcome as they could be. They, they, you know, they gave me phone numbers, please call us, that kind of thing. But I, I wasn't about to share. So what I did was I sat, I listened. I took the literature and I left. But I did know I had some work to do and I was set about doing it on my own. It would take nearly a decade, but with impetus building in her Detroit community, Maple and fellow activist Imani Williams helped found PFLAG Family Reunion in 1999. A coming out process for a parent is sometimes more difficult than the coming out process for a child. I have to figure out how I'm gonna be viewed now from my community, from my church, from any civic groups that I'm, I belong to. All of those things are large weighing measures on, on parents. And the black community is very, very quiet about things. Nobody kind of wants to um, have the one person in their family that, that's going to rock the boat or is going to stand out. For the parent that's coming for the very first time, they are coming from that black and white world. They don't understand this is a rainbow issue inside this place. All they know is that when they walk in here, they want to see some familiarity so that they can feel at ease, so that they can open up and they can communicate. We are particularly proud of PFLAG Reunion. They work tirelessly to develop resources for African-American families. And because of their hard work, we're able to provide a template of resources for families in other communities like Newark. The Newark chapter, that's a new branch. And I see that as what we would like to see as the ideal, because that chapter is already integrated. PFLAG has proven adaptable to the needs of a wide variety of cultures, racial, religious, and regional. The Rock family of Muskogee, Oklahoma, for example, knows all too well the challenges of finding resources in rural places. Didn't really know anything about being gay. All we knew was what we had heard from the pulpit and in the Southern Baptist Church. I'm Native American. I was raised up in the 60s whenever we weren't treated as good and I knew what it meant to feel like when someone, you know, made fun of you. And basically I was more worried about what he had to go through now and how his life had to be, especially in Oklahoma. There's many, many parents and young GLBT people that they are so afraid for others to know that they are gay or, or have a son or a daughter that is gay. They're afraid of what their neighbors will say, what their church will say, what their jobs will say. The first meeting there was me and Joyce, and then slowly it there was two, four, six, eight, and we got to the point where we had to move to another building because we got people that were, the building was too small. I have about four or five different mothers that I correspond with and talk to in our community that they know their child is gay but I don't know if some of them will ever tell their spouse or their families. The Rock's very public advocacy combined with their son's newspaper editorials have made them easy targets. These columns generated a lot of controversy there in, in the community. Lots of letters to the editor mm -hmm. and uh, they knew Jimmy, they knew us and so this generated the calls to us. I think we've been called just about everything in letters to the editor. But the Rocks remain steadfast in their work, incorporating education into local social events. One of the things we do in Muskogee, we they have a chili cook-off. It's one of the biggest things in the spring, and there's probably anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people that come through. In the, so we, we got a group in there last year. And we, we decided, yeah. well, year before last, we decided, yeah. okay, we're going to come out to Muskogee. <laughs> We want them to know that P flag is here and that we're a part of the community. Yeah. I had people come up to me and they would uh, say, "I've seen your article in the paper," and you know, and uh, I, I don't, I may not necessarily agree with you, but I think you, as a father, that you know, that's the right thing to do. The Rock's level of education and advocacy uh, on behalf of their child has been phenomenal and has helped persuade families and communities that the real issues have to do with fundamental fairness. So, as Native Americans, 
you know, as a family that comes from a place that is not um, you know, urban or liberal, they lead by example, simply by loving their child without condition. While the face of PFLAG has changed, so has its mission. Still, ultimately a support group, PFLAG develops programs that tailor to each community's needs and has evolved to address the issues of parents whose children are coming out younger and younger. You know, people have to have someone to look down to, to make themselves feel better, no matter whether race, religion, sexuality, whatever it is, they've got to find some scapegoat, but I think. I don't know what the future will be, but I would hope that it would come to the, where there was no difference. It never needed to be mentioned. I think that PFLAG has come a long way, and I think that we're headed in the right direction. It's funny, the other day I thought, you know, history really shapes your life. And for me, the history for gay and lesbian rights has shaped in a way, you know, which direction it went, and I am so grateful for that. We met at Dick's Bar, but um, it's proven to be um, very um, stable for us, and um, we've grown together, and we've gone through ups and downs, and good times and bad, and we're here, and we're very much in love. Um, and we've expanded our family to three chihuahuas. We're not actually um, the parental types for human children, um, but our little family of five is, is quite fun. Two years ago, filmmaker Deborah Dixon introduced us to a couple of remarkable women who at one time conformed to the strict 1950s notions of femininity. These two delightful and tenacious innovators share a passion for each other and for human rights. Ruthie and Connie, Every Room in the House, is a film about two women, Jewish women who grew up in Brooklyn in the 60s and got married in the 60s. And they did all the right thing that they were brought up to do and had children and became best friends. But when they were around 40 years old, um, Ruthie realized that she'd fallen in love with Connie. Oops. <laughs> this, like, wasn't part of uh, what was planned, and, and she asked her to kiss her. I love the idea that they started out with this very ordinary life, and then something really unusual happened, and it totally changed their life completely. You know, as a director, you can't ask for better characters. How would the school system allow someone who was an open lesbian to teach young people. I have, and I could say this, I have saved more children's lives and given them opportunities that they never would have had if they didn't meet me, their lesbian, Jewish, left-handed guidance counselor. They were always activists. So of course, when it, you know, when they discovered that they were lesbians, that became you know, a cause a for them. You know, and then when uh, they realized that that Connie couldn't be covered by Ruthie's uh, pension and welfare from the Board of Education, they sued, with, with two other couples, they sued the Board of Education and won. And of course, this was a landmark case because it was the cornerstone for the domestic partnership. You are telling them to shut up. Now this, Nobody's yes, you are. Nobody's going to shut me up because silence no, equals I just, death. I just think, I just You think better go on and find Ruth. out why I upset you so much because I make love to her. We feel live and let live, that's fine. My question is... No, you is don't think live and let live. For the men. The laws are against me. We can't get married. Don't say live and let live. I refuse to keep quiet. There are two things um, as to what made it unique or a film that I jumped at the chance to do. The film would, would be a way to combat homophobia. But it's also true uh, that this film is also very much um, for 
a gay and lesbian audience because the theme about how important it is to be who you are. Ruthie and Connie had the courage, even though, you know, their actions affected people other than themselves, you know, and they are heroines. They are role models. My name is Connie Kurtz and I'm a lesbian and it is my friend that I fell in love with. It's very important to, I think, to get that message out there that, um, you know, a person doesn't have to be just like you, you know, to be a person. And I just think that to be able to, to get that message across with so much, and have so much fun, you know, but that's what I love about Ruthie and Connie, is that they're so much fun. And you laugh and you cry and you identify with them as people, no matter what, you know, no matter who you are. She's my soulmate. For us, it's Bashir that we have been together to be who we are as lesbians, as Jewish women, as mothers, as grandmothers, in all the ways that we are, people. It's as if we were on a bicycle built for two, where you don't have to say to the other person, start with your left. We know what to start with. I love that. That's wonderful. The next day when I was working at the Hess station, uh, Which she conveniently told me that night, and that yeah. really sealed the deal for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, she came in, uh, came to visit me, and we were being really awkward outside, talking for about like an hour <laughs> or two. While I should have been paying attention to, you know, the pumps and my job, and we were out there for about an hour or so, maybe like two hours. I don't know. It was really cold. Yeah, it was really cold, and we kept talking. And um, one of my employees was stealing and letting people <laughs> steal gas <laughs> as this all was going on. So when I went inside to go uh, take care of everything, Sarah left because she was standing outside awkwardly okay. for like a half yeah, hour. Yeah, I didn't just leave. Yeah, <laughs> it was really, I was just standing there. I, was look, I looked like I was cased in the joint. And I was finally like, OK, that's it. I can't, I can't pretend to be cool anymore. It's not working. <laughs> And I went in, worked. and I went in and wrote a really, apparently a really cheesy note, and I just like wrote my name and my phone number. And, wrote, and, and call me. And call me. call me. And finally, Kate Clinton speaks out with a call to action. Do me a favor. Join GLSEN. Go to your local LGBT center. Start one. Volunteer. Be a mentor. Take a young person to a gay event. Go with them, go out after, have a latte, talk all night about it, stay up late, get some gay youth in your life. Give them a subscription to a gay magazine. Be a mentor. Endow a gay youth scholarship at your old college. Heck, endow a chair. Leave no gay child behind. Introduce yourselves. Invite a Stonewall lesbian to your school to talk about back in the day. Invite a Stonehenge lesbian, that would be me, Tuesdays with Katie. Learn your lesbian and gay history. Take a class in it, teach it. Don't just talk amongst yourselves, talk to each other. Listen, get a gay altacocker in your life. Listen to them, go down and volunteer at SAGE. Start a chapter, start the Youth Auxiliary. Do us a favor, do yourself a favor. I'm Charles Bush. For all of us at In The Life, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next month.
In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmerengen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the New Pole Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.